welcome to this lesson on gel electrophoresis. So in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at three things. First of all, gel electrophoresis, which will be the main thing, uh, then DNA probing, and also DNA microarrays. So before we get started, you need to be uh, familiar with the structure of the DNA molecule. So hopefully you've recognized that this picture on the right is the DNA molecule, but I'd like you to do this starter task for a few minutes. Can you write a paragraph describing this molecule? This could be um, an essay question that you might get set uh, in an A-level paper. So see if you can go for about nine marks, take a few minutes, write your essay, pause the video, and then come back. So here's a close-up of that, uh, that image again, showing you a few labels. Uh, if that's jogging memories, you can always pause the video and add some more to your, uh, your answer. Uh, and if you feel like you've got most of that, let's move on to my answer. Now, I'm not going to read all this to you because it's quite long. So what I suggest you do uh, in, a, in a minute uh, is to pause it. But first, have a look at these keywords, which I've highlighted. Um, so those are the words I think would probably be worthy of marks. So pause the video. Uh, you can read through my answer, compare it to yours. Uh, and if you've got those keywords in red, then I would say give yourself a mark. So did you get nine marks? Pause the video and have a go. Okay, so, and it's fair to say also that I probably missed out some stuff there. You could probably have even more detail about the structure of the DNA molecule. So we're familiar with the structure of the DNA molecule. So now we can see how we uh, can separate DNA molecules of different sizes using gel electrophoresis. So you'll need to have printed out two slides uh, if you're in my class which, uh, from the PowerPoint, which I'm sending you on Teams. And those two slides is this one and this one. So print them out on A4, uh, and then we're going to go through the electrophoresis technique. So here we go, electrophoresis. So first of all, samples are placed in wells, uh, which have been cut into a gel at one end using a fine pipette. So the samples get sort of dropped into the wells, and they're actually... Um, you mix the DNA samples that have been pre-digested with restriction enzymes. So the restriction enzymes cut the DNA into different fragments. Uh, and then you mix it with something called a loading buffer, which is heavy and causes the DNA to kind of sink down into that well as it's dropped in a, a drop at a time. Once you've loaded the samples into the well, you place it into an electrophoresis tank. And an electrophoresis tank uh, applies an electric field or a voltage across the gel. So here's how it works. At one end, we've got the cathode. So the cathode is negatively charged. You should add a little negative on this cathode here. Uh, and then the anode is positively charged. So add a little plus over here. Now the DNA fragments in the electric field, they move from the negative towards the positive electrode. And that is because on those phosphate groups, of the DNA uh, backbone, there is a negative charge. I'll just quickly jump back so you can see that over here. See these phosphate groups here? All of these negative charges cause the DNA to move towards the positive uh, anode. So where were we? We were at the anode. So the thing about this uh, movement is that larger DNA molecules have a harder time passing through the gel than smaller DNA molecules. So the larger ones move more slowly, the smaller DNA fragments move more quickly. Um, which means that, in the end, um, we have this banding pattern here, showing, showing the separated DNA fragments, um, and we have to actually reveal where the DNA is by using a dye. So that can be a, a UV DNA binding dye, for example. So that's the process in outline, and what I'd like you to do now is to watch uh, this video, for sure, Principles of DNA Gel Electrophoresis. It's a nice short one, only one minute long, which gives you a nice animation of the DNA fragments moving through the gel. And then if you want to go a little bit further to really understand the processes of loading that's going on here and the staining that would reveal the pattern, then there's two other links here. I'll put all three of those links in the video description below, and they'll also be on the PowerPoint that I'm sending out with this video. So watch those and then come back to this video. Okay, so... Let's move on. Gel electrophoresis has been covered now. Uh, and now let's talk about another related technique called SDS Page. Now, SDS Page is another technique that uses a gel and an electric current to separate uh, proteins by size or mass. And I've highlighted proteins there because previously, electrophoresis, we were talking about separating DNA fragments, and now we're talking about separating proteins. So the way it's done 
is that proteins first have to be treated to unravel them uh, and to give them an equal charge. So we treat them with two things. First of all, this, this is a bit more detailed than you need to know for A-level. First of all, we treat with this stuff called 2 mercaptor ethanol, and basically it just breaks any disulfide bonds here. So we can see that this kind of coiled up disulfide bonded protein is, uh, would be sort of unraveled. Uh, and then we use this SDS, which is a detergent. And what that does is it equalizes the surface charge on the proteins so that the distance traveled is linked only to the size. So it gives kind of regular pattern of negative charges on the uncoiled, unraveled uh, amino acid chain, which means that they, they kind of travel uh, in a predictable fashion, and therefore we can identify the mass of the proteins using some markers that are already uh, down one side of the gel, or that we run down one side of the gel. So that's SDS page. Now there's a slightly more, uh, slightly more advanced technique. You don't need to know lots of detail about this, but it's called 2D uh, page. Now 2D page can be used to separate proteins along two axes. So it's kind of, well, it's two dimensional. That's why it's called 2D. Um, so in this case, what we do is first we take a protein extract from cells or tissues. And then we first of all separate them according to um, basically their charge. So this IEF is their isoelectric uh, field or isoelectric point. So basically proteins that are positively charged would move towards negative electrode and proteins that have an overall negative charge because of various R groups would move towards the positive electrode. So the first thing we do is we separate according to their charge or, or kind of sometimes it can be their pH. Um, and then the second time we would run the uh, the uh, the electrophoresis except with the SDS, so then it would separate by mass. So we have charge along this way and then mass along this way, so we run it two times. And we would get a, uh, a kind of thing which would look a little bit like this. So in this case, the first time it's been done sort of separating the proteins by pH, and then the second time it's been done it's separated the proteins by their molecular mass, MR. Uh, so this kind of each blob here would be one protein that is present in, in large amounts in the tissue sample that was used to do this SDS page uh, gel. So SDS page and electrophoresis similar. SDS is with proteins and electrophoresis is with DNA. Okay, so now we move on to talking about uh, probing. So again, you're going to need to label your sheet that you should have downloaded and printed prior to watching this video. Um, so what is probing? Well, probing is a, a way of identifying specific sequences within DNA being studied. Um, so we need to have a single strand of DNA if we want to probe it and investigate. And what we do is we bring in a DNA probe, which is a short um, piece of DNA it would be longer than three. Uh, this isn't really an accurate uh, diagram. It would be longer than three nucleotides. The short DNA probe would be, I don't know, somewhere I would imagine between sort of 15 or 20 nucleotides, maybe even more. So we would call that an oligonucleotide. So a few nucleotides together. Um, and that DNA uh, probe will then anneal by complementary base pairing. And it'd be form the formation of hydrogen bonds would form in between uh, the bases, in, in between the complementary bases. Now, the probe has to be labelled in some way. So this could be labelled radioactive, radioactively. So, for example, with radioactive phosphorus. Remember the DNA backbone contains those phosphorus groups um, down the backbone. So we can use radioactive phosphorus to make the DNA radioactive. So that would then uh, allow detection of any DNA with a radiosensitive film. So it's just like an old school camera film, if you're familiar with what that looks like. Um, but it um, is exposed when it, it sort of darkens, when, it, when it's exposed to, um, to radioactive uh, particles. Another way of uh, labeling would be fluorescence. Okay, so fluorescence markers can also be used. Uh, you wouldn't use both here. This is just for illustrative purposes. Either you'd use ra radioactive marker or a fluorescent marker. So why would you do this? Well, DNA probes can be used for lots of things. Uh, they can be used to locate a specific gene if you want to then use it in genetic modification or genetic engineering. They can be used to identify a gene in multiple different species. So if you're looking at um, a gene in humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and uh, lemurs, then you can use this probing to make comparison studies between the different species. Or you might want to identify specific alleles of a gene, versions of a gene, to uh, identify genetic diseases, for example. 
So microarrays are basically a kind of developed version of this probing, and they use many, many thousands of DNA probes at the same time. Now, how is this done? Well, here's an image. Again, you should have this on your uh, PowerPoint. Uh, and let's go through kind of what's being done. So a DNA microarray is, can, can be made with fixed probes in these little wells. And it doesn't always have to be wells. It can sometimes be on a tiny little microscope slide and the probes are kind of printed onto the slide in a regular pattern that is recorded uh, normally on a computer that would then be able to read that pattern. So down here we have the microarray and in each little well uh, that contains, that it contains a different single stranded probe that is fixed in place, chemically bound to the well, so it can't float away. And what do we do? Well, typically we use a microarray to compare the gene expression in different tissue samples. So here I have some tissue samples. Now this could be regular skin tissue, okay? We have got um, epidermal cells, skin epidermal cells there that sort of look fairly regular. Uh, and here we have a tumor. So maybe perhaps this is a skin cancer tumor. The cells you can see are different. So maybe we wanna figure out what genes are working differently in the normal cells, in the normal tissue, versus the cancer cells. Because if we know the differences in the gene expression, we can maybe choose the correct uh, therapies to target that cancer. So how would we do this? Well, the first thing is we take uh, a sample from the tumor, the test sample, and from the, uh, the kind of normal cells, the reference sample. And first we have to say that this is messenger RNA. So we take the messenger RNA, um, that's the genes that are actively being transcribed and used in the two cells, we have to convert that into DNA. So we do that by a process of reverse transcription. Using enzymes uh, actually isolated from retroviruses, we do reverse transcription, and now we get DNA. And actually we could put a little tiny small C in front of that called cDNA, which means it's sort of DNA that has been copied from the messenger RNA. So we have this cDNA now, and we label it fluorescently. We label it uh, fluorescently, in this case, we label it for us fluorescent red, and in this case, we'd label it fluorescent green. We then um, place those uh, cDNAs into the array. We kind of wash them over the array. So um, anywhere where the probes, there are different probes in these little uh, wells, anywhere those probes match the DNA, the cDNA, the cDNA sticks, okay? It sticks in different places in the microarray. Uh, we allow it time to stick firmly and we wash away any DNA that hasn't stuck, okay? So now we've got our microarray with the probes and parts of DNA stuck to it. Now we test with uh, two different lasers. One that's gonna um, cause fluorescence if it's labeled with the red um, dye, so that's the kind of tumor cells cDNA is going to glow red, and one which will uh, cause fluorescence if it's labeled with the green dye. So that would be only causing fluorescence if the um, normal cells um, genes are being expressed. So we get a, a pattern for the red laser and a pattern for the green laser. And actually what we get is not like this really. I've got a better example. We get a readout which is a bit like this. So what does this mean? Well, in this case, what it means is that if a um, well, if a probe is glowing red, that's an easy one, like there, I kind of colored that one in, but you can see another one there. If it's glowing red, then that is a gene that is expressed only in the test. Okay, so maybe this is an oncogene that is only turned on in the cancer, and that might be important to, to target it. And then some green ones are only turned on in the reference. So the green ones here, the, the, sort of, uh, the darker green ones are actually even more specific. Those green ones are only causing fluorescence in the reference or normal tumor, uh, sorry, normal non-cancerous cells. So maybe that would be a gene which is involved in a sort of mitosis checkpoint that has been disrupted and it isn't being expressed in the tumor. If it's yellow, that means actually, if you think about the different combinations of light, that means red and green light is being produced from that well. So that means both um, the tumor cells and regular cells are expressing that gene. So that, those are genes that kind of don't show a difference between the test and the reference population. So with this kind of DNA microarray uh, technology, we can start to kind of work out 
what um, what are the what the differences between different tumors are, and target therapies to the individual mutations that occur in different patients' tumors, for example. Okay, so we've reached the end of that lesson. So now I want you to do these five questions, and you'll find these on page 227 of your book, to just summarize what we've learned. And you can, of course, read over uh, pages 227 to 225, 26, and 27 to go over this again. You can make extra notes and then answer these questions in your book. Pause the video, and we'll put the mark scheme up in a second, and you can see how you do. All right. So here's the mark scheme. Uh, did you get this right? Green pen this work. Remember to add in keywords, very, very important in biology, and then send me evidence of your completed notes uh, and these questions on Teams, please. But before we go, of course, we're gonna do the final thing, which is the syllabus check. Do you understand what you should be able to? So uh, the principles and uses of electrophoresis for separating nucleic acid fragments or for proteins. Um, and in the syllabus, it says there should be an opportunity for practical use of electrophoresis. Now, unfortunately, we, we aren't able to do that because we're uh, kind of doing this distance learning thing. So I would recommend if you want to get a better understanding of the practical considerations, watch those three videos that I've linked underneath. Uh, in fact, there's a fourth video on DNA probing I'll link as well. So you can watch all those practical videos to get more of an idea how practically this is done. Okay, thanks very much for that lesson. Next lesson, we're going to be looking at genetic engineering. Uh, and we've only got, I think, about three more lessons to do the syllabus. Genetic engineering, uh, gene therapy, oh, and issues relating to genetic engineering. Okay, so thanks very much. Bye-bye.